But the general trend is that uh, the downstream Mach number M2 uh, decreases with increasing M1. And as you can see here, the static uh, static temperature increases with uh, increasing uh, Mach number. And this uh, does not seem to be asymptoting to a constant value. It seems to just continuously and monotonically increase with M1. The same is true for uh, P2 or P1 also. So, the pressure after the shock continues to increase with Mach number. Notice that although uh, P2 is greater than P1, uh, T2 is greater than T1, rho 2 over rho 1 which is equal to P2 over P1 times T1 over T2. So, this quantity is still greater than 1. Okay? Although this is greater than 1 and this is also this is less than 1, this quantity is still greater than 1 as you can see from here and this also seems to be trending towards uh, both this and this uh, seem to be trending towards uh, uh, tending towards uh, an asymptotic value. The most important quantity of course uh, is P02 or P01. So, you can see that there is a, an increase in the loss of stagnation pressure with an increase in M1 which is understandable. Okay? The shock becomes stronger and stronger as the initial Mach number increases. So, the loss of stagnation pressure is also quite high. So, you can see that for M1 equal to 5, actually for M1 equal to 5, the solution that we have derived is strictly speaking not valid. Okay, because the temperature downstream of the shock wave would be very high and the gas would be far from being calorically perfect. Okay. So, this is an analytical solution, but sort of gives us an idea. So, you can see that at M1 equal to 5, the loss of stagnation pressure is almost 90 percent. But the interesting thing is uh, for uh, uh, for M1 equal to 2, the loss of stagnation pressure is only about 30 percent or so. It begins to fall steeply only after uh, M1 equal to 2. So, in fact, uh, by allowing uh, by allowing M2 to tend to infinity, I am sorry, M1 to tend to infinity, we can actually show that the asymptotic value for M2 is this, which is what we are seeing, uh, we are seeing here. And the asymptotic value for rho 2 over rho 1 is this, which is what we are seeing here. And other values uh, tend to infinity as m1 goes to infinity. Okay, now, we turn to the uh, issue of effectiveness or efficiency. Okay. So, in a normal shock wave, P02 is less than P01, obviously there is a loss of stagnation pressure. Okay. Uh, but the important thing is so for isentropic uh, compression process, P02 is equal to P01 and that is highly desirable, no doubt about it. Loss of stagnation pressure implies irreversibility, which implies loss of work. Okay. However, um, if you look at um, uh, say a normal shock solution like this, Okay. So, for a given value of uh, <coughs> V1, specific volume V1 and uh, V2, the pressure that is reached by a uh, normal shock compression process is over here. Whereas, the pressure as a result of an isentropic compression process would have been over here. Notice that this is S equal to constant. <coughs> so, that is the isentropic uh, uh, line. So, isentropic compression process would follow this line and for a given V1 and V2, the pressure that we would reach is only this, whereas the pressure that we reach with, um, uh, with the normal shock process is much higher. So, in a practical uh, uh, application like for example, uh, the uh, diffuser of a supersonic of the engine in a supersonic aircraft, uh, 
okay. Um, uh, given V1 and V2 uh, or the specific volume that we are talking about corresponds to the size of the or length of the diffuser, okay. Um, so, which means that for a given length of the uh, uh, diffuser, uh, normal shock compression can accomplish a higher uh, exit pressure when compared to isentropic compression, although there is a loss of stagnation pressure. Okay. So, that is an important aspect. So, what will uh, in the case of uh, supersonic aircraft, weight is a very, very critical uh, performance criterion. The longer the um, uh, intake, the more its weight and the more the drag will be. Okay. So, it should be short and we also would like the pressure at the end of the diffuser to be as high as possible and minimal loss of stagnation pressure. So, these are conflicting requirements. So, what I am trying to show here is that normal shock is very effective as a compression process. So, for a given change in specific volume, it can achieve a higher pressure or let us look at uh, let us look at it the other way around. For a given pressure change, what is the um, uh, we, we look at it this way, okay. I am sorry. So, for a given uh, pressure rise, okay. So, let us say for a given pressure rise, which means P12, P12, P2. So, for a given pressure rise, the normal shock compression process is able to achieve, uh, achieve it with a certain change in specific volume, whereas the isentropic compression process. So, we go along the isentropic compression line until we hit this pressure P2. So, you can see that for the isentropic compression process, the change in specific volume is much more than the change in specific volume for the normal shock compression process. Which means that if you want to compress the flow uh, uh, isentropically, so that there is no loss of stagnation pressure, you require a longer diffuser. But longer diffuser, as I said, uh, means more weight, more drag. So, although you may have saved, uh, 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 I mean, you have avoided loss of stagnation pressure, you are actually paying the penalty somewhere else. So, normal shock compression in this case, as you can see from both these cases, normal shock compression is very effective, but it is not as efficient as the isentropic compression process because of the loss of stagnation pressure. Now, if you look at this, uh, I am sorry, if you look at uh, this diagram here, you can see that the uh, loss of stagnation pressure in a normal uh, shock compression process is not actually bad until about m equal to 2. So, if you uh, if you want to design a, a supersonic diffuser, which can diffuse a supersonic flow from higher Mach numbers uh, to let us say uh, transonic Mach number, the best thing would be to accomplish that compression using, uh, uh, using a mechanism other than normal shock until you hit a Mach number of 2 and once you hit a Mach number of 2, uh, probably you can uh, use a normal shock to achieve the rest of the compression because normal shock is actually not only quite uh, efficient, but I am sorry quite effective, but also reasonably efficient for Mach numbers less than 2. Okay. So, that is the best compromise that we can have when you are actually designing the diffuser. So, typically what would be done is for Mach numbers above 2, uh, the compression would be achieved, compression and deceleration of the flow would be achieved using oblique shock waves until you hit Mach number of 2 at which point you will terminate the uh, compression and deceleration process using a normal shock wave. Okay. That is what is typically done in this uh, supersonic diffusers. So, as I said, normal shock compression is more effective, but less efficient than isentropic compression because of loss of stagnation pressure. Okay. Effectiveness is very important in practical designs because it determines the physical dimension. Okay. The latter attribute which is efficiency, loss of stagnation pressure is also important. So, you have to determine an optimal design like what I described just now. Let us work out an example involving uh, a normal shock wave. So, air at 100 kPa and 300 Kelvin and moving at 696 meter per second encounters a stationary normal shock determine the static and stagnation properties ahead of and behind the shock wave. Okay. So, static temperature and static pressure are given, the speed 
of the fluid. Uh, so, P T, P 1, T 1 and V 1 are all given. So, this is V 1, this is T 1, P 1. Okay. So, P 1 is given, T 1 is given, V 1 is given and we can evaluate uh, the speed of sound A 1 equal to square root of gamma R T 1 that comes out to be 348. So, M 1 comes out to be 2. Now, we can of course, substitute um, uh, this into the expression for T 0 and P 0 and evaluate or we can also use uh, uh, tabulated values for this. Let us see uh, the gas table. So, here as you can see uh, T 0 over T, uh, T 0 over uh, static temperature T, T 0 over T and P 0 over P are all given as uh, functions of Mach number. So, we can easily go to this uh, table and for instance, uh, uh, retrieve this entry from the table. For m equal to 2, uh, we have uh, t 0 over t equal to this number and p 0 over p equal to this number. So, we can now uh, evaluate t 0 and p 0. Now, once I have m 1, I can always uh, do the following. Once I have m 1, once I have m 1, I can evaluate m 2 from this expression. Once I have m 2, I can then uh, evaluate p 2 or p 1, t 2 or t 1 from this expression. But uh, this actually can be uh, made uh, done much uh, easily by going to the normal shock table. Okay? So, the normal shock table lists for various values of m1, it lists m2, p2 over p1, t2 over p1, p02 over p01. For m1 equal to 2, I can go here, retrieve m2, which is 0.577, p2 over p1, pressure rise is factor is 4.5, t2 over t1 is equal to this. So, p2 over p1 is equal to 4.5, so I can get p2, I can get t2 and p02 over p01 is 0 0.72. So, the loss of stagnation pressure as you can see is roughly about uh, 38 or so, P02 over P01 is 0 0.7209. So, the loss is um, uh, roughly about 30 percent or so, yeah. 30, yeah, something like that. And M2 is also known. So, once M2 is known, uh, the velocity of the fluid downstream of the shock wave may be evaluated. Notice that the velocity was 696 meter per second, it has now come down to 260.8 meter per second. So, the flow has been decelerated across practically zero distance from 696 to 260.8. So, that is the power of the shock wave. So, you can see these values are entered here. So, you can see that uh, since the width of the shock wave is negligibly small. We can see uh, how effective shock wave compression process is. So, if we wanted to decelerate a fluid like this, we would have used a diffuser for example. So, a diffuser would have a finite length. It will require a finite length to decelerate the fluid from 696 to 260.8 meter per second. Whereas, the shock wave does it with zero distance or does it in zero distance and accomplishes a compression increase in static pressure from 100 to 450 kilo Pascal nearly four and a half times. So, the purpose of the diffuser is to decelerate the flow and convert the moment to uh, momentum of the fluid incoming fluid to uh, pressure rise. Right. So, if you look at uh, how to do that effectively, the shock wave is very, very effective. It accomplishes this sort of deceleration and this sort of pressure rise across zero distance. Whereas the diffuser requires a finite length to do that. When you have a finite length, that means you add to the weight of the engine and you increase the drag because as the fluid flows through the uh, through a finite uh, length uh, diffuser, there is wall skin friction drag. Okay, so now you can see how normal shock compression can be attractive for certain applications, even though there is a loss of stagnation pressure. And in this case, we said loss of stagnation pressure is about 30 percent or so, it can still be attractive because it is extremely effective.
So, this completes our discussion of one dimensional flows. What we uh, will do in the next lecture is um, uh, start our discussion of quasi one dimensional flows which is essentially flow through nozzles.